Hi, Misha here, and now that the group, or pod, as they were sometimes called, is complete from Star Wars The Black Series, let's talk about Delta Squadron from the game Republic Commando. As you might imagine, I did not play it. However, they have more recently appeared in things like The Bad Batch, and before that, even before Disney and the Clone Wars. So, yeah, they, they're they around. And they are basically, yeah, just Republic Commandos. In the past, I did a video kind of comparing Commandos versus ARC Troopers, Advanced Recon Commando. And primarily, ARCs are at the tip-top. But they're also designed to either be leaders of other groups or to work alone kind of as advisors. Whereas Republic Commandos, they were clones, of course, of Jango Fett, but they were designed to work in groups of four. In fact, they were trained up from youngsters together, hence the whole pod thing, and worked as a unit. They could work separately, but they worked better as a unit, each of them having a specialty. To this end, they also had special weapons, Really, really just one special weapon that was configurable in half a dozen different ways and special armor, Katarn armor. So we have all four now, kind of going in reverse release order. We have RC-1262 Scorch, and then we have Fixer here. RC 12. <laughs> Sorry about that. You ever say something and realize you said it wrong? Oh well. RC 1140. And no, I didn't actually run and check. I just had to let my brain mentally reset. It's been a long day. Fixer. And then we have RC 1207 Sev, which is what I was about to say earlier, which is hilarious because it's in his name. And then Finally, the leader and the one we got first in the Black Series, RC-1138, Boss. Boss is a sergeant, and Fixer is the corporal, and presumably Scorch and Sev are privates, or whatever equivalent was in the Grand Army of the Republic. And these are all very similar figures, just differences in the detail, but they were a group. Some have criticized because it's built on the Hunter, who is also a commando body, saying it should be bigger and bulkier. Well, whatever. I will say that if you look at Jango Fett or Boba Fett as a figure, he's not super big and bulky. In fact, there's only a few clones that are, and they're aberrations like Wrecker. So I think it kind of depends if you're going for more of a video game look or a real world look. For what it's worth, typically in the real world, your special operations guys, especially if they're going to be pilots or whatever, a huge body is actually more of a detriment than an asset. With that, we'll talk about them, some of the history, and of course their gear. And we'll begin with Scorch here. So, commandos were, if not trained from birth, very early on, as their aptitudes became clear, they were, received some flash training, but they were a little more unique in that, that they were trained by actual live instructors. There were about 100 stationed on Camino, and 75 of those were actual true Mandalorians, most picked by Jango Fett. And the sergeant in charge of training Delta Force was known as Vaughn. Or va, v a u. He was quite ruthless, hard-assed, even at times cruel and abusive. Other trainers, the Covendar, thought so as well. But he wasn't doing it to be a jackass. Well, he probably enjoyed being a jackass. But other things, his idea was: if I am very hard on them now, maybe they'll come back home or not die as soon so 
his motives are generally good, and his men generally really appreciated him for it. He was a father figure, and pretty much every one of these has a story. Now, Scorch here, he was the team's demolitions guy, explosives guy. He was also tasked with disarming things, removing detonators. He didn't find that as fun, I'm, I'm sure. From a young age, he just liked fire and blowing things up. In fact, that's where his name came from. He burned his facial hair off and that of Sergeant Va. I'm sure that, that um, made him very happy. And so his customization, what he really did, he had the DC-17M, the configurable weapon that all of the Deltas did, but he preferred it in its third mode, the anti-materiel, anti-armor launcher. And that's what this figure comes with here. <clears throat> because it's not just getting the full Delta Squad. They actually did in the Black Series the appropriate gun or variant of the gun. And in this case, also backpack. So this was really neat. He was the most recent one to come out. And it gives you the final variation to collect on the DC-17M, which we will circle back around here in a minute. But um, these all did very well in training, even live fire, something that Sergeant Va was quite proud of. And they were just getting ready when, of course, 22 B, uh, BBY, the Battle of Geonosis, happened, and they were rushed in a little early, so much so that each member took his own lot gunship down to Geonosis, and they met up, rendezvoused. They were assigned to assassinate a Geonosian lieutenant, which they did. They actually Sev took the kill. After that, they were sent to destroy a droid factory that another group could not. And following that, Delta Squadron became quite famous, even early on, by being the first Republic unit to successfully penetrate a Separatist warship, a Lequahoe freighter, which they sabotaged and retrieved data from, and quite successful. After that, they were put on what was called cooldown for a few weeks on board an acclimator class transport, what we might think of as a proto Star Destroyer, and thus they had a few days down, but it wouldn't last for very long. Next up, one that actually didn't come out that long ago either, Fixer. And you can see he's got a different style of backpack. And I have rubber banded his uh, blaster to his hip, specifically his left hip, which is kind of important, we'll get to later. Because I wanted his hand free, I actually gave him the little fob from uh, the client, but I thought a little electronic device in his hands suited him well and gives him yet more antennas. Never can have enough. Because, in addition to being the unit's second in command, its corporal, he was its resident slicer, hacker, uh, tech guy, computer guy. But um, he was known for being pretty by the book, regulation driven, little quiet, little subdued Saturnine. But when he was younger, he was also a little mischievous, at least in a quiet way. In fact, there were major worries that he might hack into the systems of the communions, cities, and whatnot. So steps were taken by Sergeant Va to basically make sure he didn't have too much time to get bored or unsupervised access to a data port because bad things could happen. So here we have him as kind of a serious one. He was kind of the unit's older brother figure, breaking up the two lower ranks a little bit if they got into matches or distractions. Bit of a stick in the mud. He still liked using the names. Again, he is uh, RC1140. So he actually still enjoyed calling them by their numbers when everyone else adopted their nicknames, which all the nicknames were were done during um, 
training, and I have to imagine that Fixer might be a bit of a joke. He probably broke more than he fixed when he was younger. Been there, done that. <clears throat> but even though he was a computer guy, he's definitely a Stone Cold Killer. He's a Republic Commando, after all. He just happened to kill people via computers sometimes, or a blaster to the face. You know, whatever works. You know, he had options. Of course, this is the same body, but a different paint scheme. Helmet is the Katarn type helmet. He does have a unique backpack. And he comes with the standard DC-17M. This one's in the assault rifle or blaster mode. Again, we'll revisit that in a minute. Well, after they were on cooldown and then they transferred off the acclimator, they were actually called right back to it because it disappeared on a mission, appearing about two weeks later, seemingly abandoned. So since Delta Squadron had spent time on that exact ship, they were sent to investigate, this time getting to do some zero-G, a space walkover, and they uh, discovered that there were Transocean slavers on board. That's a Bosk species. But after fighting them... They soon discovered that the Transocean's idea was to salvage the ship and sell it to the CIS because at this time the Acclimator was kind of the standard Republic ship. So towards the end of the mission, they got to fight some CIS forces when all luck were hope pulled up and, you know, dropped off some droids for the party. They were just getting out of that mission when they ended up having to go rescue another commando squadron, Omega. And from there, after a few shenanigans... Delta would be transferred to Korskant, where they would have their home base, their home barracks from now on in the war. And they would actually do some out-of-uniform, or at least out-of-armor missions. They were kind of anti-terrorist and uh, trying to root out potential CIS saboteurs on the uh, home world, on the capital of the Republic. So they were far from bored, even though by this point we're about a year into the war. Next up, number three, we have Sev, the other junior member of the team, if so it could be said. Rank was pretty informal with commandos. Again, they grew up together, so they're basically a family unit. He would be one of the younger brothers, with uh, Fixer being kind of the older brother, like I said. Guess what his specialty is? Yeah, he's the... DMR, the designated marksman in Delta. And he has an interesting personality. I, uh, he's often said to have been a bit of a psychotic person, maybe even a psychopath, but only to his enemies. His thing growing up, well, it was said first off that it's possible that his uh, maturation tank or grow tube or whatever it would be might have been spiked because he was... Uh, little different coming out, but not in a bad way, at least for a commando. Growing up, he did everything he could to impress the sergeant, Sergeant Va, and he was very interested in Mandalorian culture. All of the commandos, to one extent or another, were into Mandalorian culture, adopting sayings and chants and rituals and holidays, but Sev in particular was the Mandoiest of them all in behavior. And interestingly, even though he was maybe the most ruthless, he's the one that was most likely to have joined the Rebellion. When we get to the end and talk about their fates of each of these, I'll go into that more. I will say that Geonosis had a big impact on him. The official report was that 4,982 commandos died in that battle. And uh, because of that battle, Sev here had a hatred of the Geonosians, and he wanted to kill 4,900 82 of them, just to make things even. 4,983 would be, uh, you know, just making it a little better. But yeah, he was the marksman, the crack shot. He was the one that actually shot the spaceship out of the air during the Battle of Geonosis that killed their target. He used the DC-17M in its DMR configuration with the long barrel and really provided that long-range expertise that the squad needed, but he was quite ruthless and at times let his bloodlust get after him. Moving on throughout the war, 
Delta Squad had several interesting missions. During one, they actually recovered the body of a Jedi and his Padawan and reported directly to the Jedi High Council during that mission. And um, this was really because after their early missions, they were recognized by Mace Windu, even giving them awards. So when the Jedi needed something, they often turned to Delta. They also were the first to alert the Jedi to Savage Opress, getting some intel on him during that same mission. A short time later, Chancellor at the time, Palpatine, used them because they were considered the best of the commandos. They were also the only squadron to have made it out of Geonosis without any casualties and to still be there as we get into the war. So they're the only one really fully intact, at least of the original group. There might have been later ones, but yeah. But this one was because there was a Camino scientist that went missing and it was felt that she might be trying to join the CIS and could give away cloning secrets. That was the official reason they were sent to retrieve her. Unofficially, Palpatine wanted her so he could make an underground, possibly illegal cloning operation of his own on one of the moons of Coruscant. Unfortunately, for everyone really, she wasn't so much willing to go as she was kind of lightly kidnapped, ended up going to Mandalore, and uh, there uh, some of the sergeants tried to get her to fess up on how to slow the aging of the clones because they were double aging of course even past their youth but instead she killed herself and yeah this didn't work out well for anyone but officially she wasn't in the hands of the separatists so you know that was something but uh, there were several other missions they had some aquatic missions using scuba gear and uh, what have you but as 19 BBY comes and the war is heating up and coming to its climax Delta would find itself on Kashyyyk. And finally we come to RC-1138, Boss. Named because he was the boss of the group and the sergeant. Growing up, he had very high aptitude, very high test scores, especially for it, the range and live fire and just, you know, command decisions. Whereas Sev tried to gain the sergeant's attention it was actually Boss here who really gained the attention of the sergeant. So he became a bit of a protege and understudy. And in a lot of ways, I would say that uh, Boss mirrors a younger version of the Mandalorian. He was uh, gruff and to the point, a ruthless killer, but also quite honor-bound. Relatively quiet, but much like the sergeant, cared about his men a great deal. Loyalty and all that. So quite Mandalorian. In fact, Tamara Morrison did voice Tim and not the others. And he, uh, Morrison said that uh, of all the clones that Camino created, this is the one most identical to Jango Fett. So hey, it came from the man itself. So I'm going to go with it. The figure is maybe the plainest of them all, but that's okay because he's kind of the player character in the game. He's got the standard DC-17M He's got the standard backpack, the standard Katarn armor, but that's okay. He's the leader, kind of the do-it-all. The He's the Mario. But this is like Super Mario 2. He's, he's Mario. We'll let you guess which one's Peach. But he was the dedicated leader, and it would come... That would actually put him in a big pickle when it came to Kashyyyk. Now, they were among the first there. Now, this is long before the Battle of Kashyyyk that we see in Re Revenge of the Sith. Delta actually went in early as kind of a forward movement because there were raids from Trandoshan slavers on the Wookiees, the two races having a bit of a long history, and they were sent to see why. Well, as uh, Delta, Delta soon discovered, the uh, Trandoshans were being backed by the CIS on Kashyyyk and kind of spurring things on. They also ended up capturing some important Wookiees, including an important chieftain that Delta would have to go rescue. And uh, it was enough of an important op that General Grievous went there and um, let his Magna Guards play with Delta. Guess who won? Uh, but of course, as usual, uh, uh, Grievous just fled away in the, the soulless one. But that was all before Yoda came, along with Commander Gree and the 
41st uh, Legion. Once they were there, you'd think that'd be better because there's an outright invasion of Kashyyyk, though. The CIS decided to just take the planet over, which led to the battle, and Delta was still there when this happened. But, right as things were very hot, Seb would get split off from the group, and uh, while Boss was getting his other men together to go rescue him, he was ordered directly by Yoda to break off and return to orbit. Now, to his mind, this is completely against the code, but he very reluctantly followed the order after basically being given no choice. Now, from a general's point of view, this was a very good order because... It let the Deltas get out and let Yoda make a counteroffensive and push the CIS off the planet. So from a strategic point of view, leaving Sev behind was logical. From a tactical and commando cologne point of view, it was unthinkable. And uh, this is pretty much where the game ends. Afterwards, the... Uh, the group is sent back to Coruscant, and then we have Order 66, and of course the Republic goes away, and the Empire replaces it. But of course that wouldn't necessarily be the end of the clones, at least not for a few years until the Stormtroopers are ready. And clones like these actually helped train the earliest Stormtroopers, initially known as the TK Troopers. But before you get to the end, let's talk about the gear and weapons of the Republic Commando. Because they're from a video game and because they're considered elite commandos, part of uh, the Special Operations Division of the Grand Army of the Republic, Delta Squadron's equipment was unique to them, at least to Republic Commandos. And our boss here is, like I said, a good standard example. At first his uniform armor might look standard, but it's not. It's Katarn class commando armor. Different helmet and different armor plating. Although it does have the more or less standard black kind of body glove suit underneath, which is an insulator. It protects against things like harsh environments, cold, heat, even the vacuum of space, but it also is designed to insulate against uh, electric shocks and blasters and even some kinetic protection from falls and blunt force impacts, but that's a little more limited. It, they do have a special backpack. This was used to carry extra ammunition, also sabotage gear, little dilly wobbers for equipment, also medicine, food, water, and it was easy to reconfigure. You could, for example, take extra ammo out and put an oxygen tank in for more time, say, underwater or in zero-G. It's a backpack. It's configurable. You can kind of do your thing with it. Our helmet here, it has a long-range, high-frequency antenna an air filtration system. It also can serve as a space helmet for zero G. The visor has a heads up display, a HUD inside that connects directly with the weapon. So they don't actually have to use the sights as such. And actually the weapon is another special thing for the Republic Commandos. This is the Blastec DC-17M. In case anyone was wondering, yeah, I put a uh, pistol belt on the figure. He didn't come with it, but I thought a sergeant needs a pistol, and typically they would carry the DC-17 pistol, the commando pistol that we see with the ARC troopers. Some also had the DC-15S pistol, but that had some issues. One neat thing is that this pistol used a few of the same small components and energy as this rifle or rifle system, modular system. Now the uh, commandos were trained with this weapon from a very young age 
and it was in turn specially designed for them. In fact, Blastec designed it after a request, well, I guess a request in secret because the Grand Army of the Republic didn't exist yet, but for a adaptable modular weapon that could be sent in and changed in the battlefield or even, if really necessary, changed in the heat of combat. And it started off with three basic modes and this is the assault rifle or blaster it's a ion pulse weapon at its core it uh, has 60 shots per clip energy clip and unique at the time the clip was located on the left side for faster changes now of course later the stormtrooper blaster the e11 would have it on the left so it's mirroring what may become later but the uh, DC-15A and DC-15S had it on the right, which were the standard commando guns. But this was built to a higher standard, higher QC, and generally speaking was more tolerant to extreme heat, cold, dust, ice. But it did require a little more professionalism, routine maintenance, cleaning, a lot like a real-world firearm, come to think of it. Sometimes the nicest guns in the world do great if they have qualified users, not just grunts. It's actually why I've said in over Mishiko channel, Mishiko channel videos that, you know, the Swiss Smith Rubin's a great gun for Switzerland. It would have done terrible if it had been the Russian standard gun. But, yeah, this is, this, this is the standard blaster. It's good at short to medium ranges. It's rated out to about 450 meters. And uh, typically they would carry five spare energy cells for it, so a total of 300 shots on board one trooper. Although, if he knew he was going into battle and needed more, he could make room in his backpack or, you know, get it from somewhere else. So, yeah, boss here, our standard guy. And now we bring Sev back out. A few other neat features of the Kataran armor. It had Bacta built in where it could auto-inject the wearer if he was hurt. Of course, in the video game, there's a reason for this. And it also had built-in personal shield generators. At least some versions of this armor did because there, there were more than one. But of course, what's unique about him, as opposed to a boss we just looked at, he has the same standard backpack. But he has the DMR configuration of the DC-17M. This is the same core weapon, but you remove the barrel and magazine chassis from the rifle, and you insert this long barrel and alternative magazine hanging below here. And that reduces the number of rounds fired to five. But these are very powerful rounds. They're less like standard blaster bolts and more like, say, a, a bowcaster, a, a quillion. A, they, they are a, a powerful boof. So you only get five on the sniper, but they're much more powerful. And, of course, they have a longer range of about a kilometer. To go along with it, built into the heads-up display in the helmet, it has a 10 power, some even say 20 power zoom. One would assume it's variable because it's electronics. And I'm sure there's stabilization and all that. So that's what Sev preferred. And all members would carry the full kit to, uh, to convert if they needed to. The armor itself was about 20 kilograms. It was designed to be lightweight. It was said that it was second only to actual Mandalorian armor made from Beskar. Because it was kind of built on that pattern. But, just, you know, not quite as special. Has a duraplast, excuse me, a duraplast weave uh, composite material for the outer plates. They're, they're kind of sandwiched so it can take a direct hit. Even the helmet can take a direct hit, although, of course, um, not quite as well as the armor itself. These were made especially for the commandos by Kaminoan armor smiths in the by law, this was not available to anyone but commandos, although some did make it onto the black market. 
just as I gave a pistol to Boss because he needed something, I gave one here to Sev. My thinking was that since uh, Crosshair has a pistol, he's the sniper in Bad Batch, that Sev should too. And since he's such a big fan of Mandalorian stuff, I gave him a West Star pistol instead of uh, DC-17. And it is known that while they used most of these guns, they did train on certain Mandalorian weapons, including the West Stars. I, uh, I think this might be the neatest gun that any of these come with because we have so few sniper-type weapons within the Black Series. And the fact that they went to the trouble of uh, making it for Sev here. Of course, you could say it would have been neat if they gave you one gun and you could reconfigure it yourself. But at this size, I think it would end up being too weak and flimsy. I think it's okay just to, you know, swap it around. I think I have a loose one. Yeah, here's the another DC-17M. This is actually Wreckers, but I had it loose. This is the base. Some have criticized these for being too small, but I don't think so. The weapon itself was roughly 5 kilograms. I would assume, considering that's quite a bit of weight, that actually includes the, all the accessories, attachments. And uh, when you consider that this is 112 scale, this would be over a foot long. Interestingly, with no shoulder stock, but there's more of a video, a video game reason for that. But it is nice that the DC-17M was carried over to newer things like the Bad Batch. And now we come to our third and final original configuration. The RPG, as it's sometimes called, the Anti-Material version. It's not so much a separate config, as more of an addition. Kind of like how you put a M203 on an M16 bolting to the left side this is a single shot weapon sorry point your memory remember it's a tube now that does bolt up top and have some other stuff going on stabilization gear because with only one shot you don't want to miss and to reload it you've got to reach down and grab it off your hip that's where uh, scorch here carried him now, some criticism of this figure is that he's got two plus the one, when typically he carried three reloads. Also, because they're strapped to his hip, that's kind of where I got the idea to strap things to other guys' hips. Even kind of looks like a rubber band. <laughs> you could just say he's already used one, and that's why he's got three left. But yeah, they didn't carry many. Now, they could carry additional grenades in the backpack here, and this is... Um, Showing you a reconfiguration of the standard Katarn armor backpack for demo demolitions people like old Scorch here. So he actually has some unique pieces. We get a special version of the gun, we get this leg piece, and we get this backpack. And you'll notice he's actually the only one of these four I haven't modified. And that's what's kind of neat about these figures you're not trying to go to like a, a accuracy from a movie so you can have fun with them you kind of configure them these are just generic in a lot of ways commandos almost army builders and it's nice that they actually did the full squad a few other features of the Katarn armor it actually had retractable vibro blades which were basically knives but with a electronic edge for more cutting in the wrists and the gauntlets these are either for close range fighting or fighting in areas where blasters weren't advisable or if your primary weapons were otherwise not available it had those as kind of a built-in last line of defense weapon of course these uh, have the standard articulation that's not really what I talk about here because it just doesn't much matter to me. They move in a lot of ways. Sometimes I think they could probably move more as figures than they could in real armor. Although the armor, since it is multiple plates, around 20, 
and since it's magnetically locked to the undergarment instead of being bolted on would give better flexibility and while 20 kilograms is not light these are strong guys they can take it little helmet and visor here got the uh, bigger shoulder pads and kind of the expanded chest plate this armor really could take a hit even from the beginning it was very well made very durable a little better than phase one clone armor at any rate although not always as comfortable especially for interesting positions but they would improve it throughout the war in fact we would have a total of four variants and so fixer here to talk about those this figure is pretty standard to boss he comes with the same blaster you know just a rifle version but he does have a unique backpack with this uh, array on top and he has a unique helmet or at least in addition to the helmet and like I said I gave him the little fob because I just thought having a little techie thing in his hand would look good I do wish these came with uh, holsters or some way to holster their weapons but that's not something you see clones having much at all anyway it's personal taste otherwise yeah same configuration as the rest but that's okay because they're a team grown together and fighting together so the first version of course was uh, what was used in the battle geonosis we've talked about it the second version would come a few months later about half, half a year in the year war and the mark ii had protection against EMPs and certain kinetic weapons, shatter guns that the um, CIS units were using when they found the deficiencies in the armor. So they went against that. Mark III would come, oh, about a year after that. And it would have better protection against light laser cannons and um, like explosive blasts and things like that more concussive things so it was quite strong and finally around 19 bby towards the end of the war there would be a special night fighting version i don't know if it was actually called a mark IV or if it was just called a mark three you know commando night fighter whatever but it would be the final variant made because after the end of the clone wars the katarn armor production was ordered halted and the facilities destroyed shut down by the empire with the night fighting version had improved night vision all katarn armor had night vision built into the helmet but it was better and it also had better stealth infiltration gear subterfuge you know jamming gear integrated it in its backpack i think it was used in places like umbara things like that So we had the total of four versions, you know, just, you know, based on things they learned throughout the, uh, throughout the Clone Wars. But most of the changes would all be internal. They wouldn't really be reflected externally here. Although, Black Series did make a version of the ARC Trooper armor for Umbar. So that's kind of neat. So, yeah, in a lot of ways, Fixer here is very standard, but he still has some neat stuff. There would also be a few additional things made for these. For example, at around 21 BBY, the PEPF would be made as an additional option for the uh, DC-17M. In layman's terms, that was basically just a stun setting, a stun version that would shoot a low-intensity pulse. Uh, it, it would basically knock you out. You would live, but you might not wish to have because it said that recovering from the PEPF blast was unpleasant but that was added for more specialized missions because the whole idea around the DC-17M was well we're sending troopers in with very little intelligence we don't know what they will need so let's just send them in with a gun that can be adapted a weapon system that can be adapted as best as possible so they realized that they might have infiltration missions where killing 
was not desired. And then finally, a year after that or so, not Blastec, but Mirson would introduce a different type of grenade for that attachment, which would shoot a breaching charge, kind of knocking the hole in the side of an armored building. The standard grenade could and did penetrate armor, even tanks and that kind of thing, but you had to get pretty close. The uh, Mirson breaching device could be shot from a longer range off, but it had certain defects and uh, wasn't all that popular, but it was an option and uh, brought the total configurations of their weapon up to five. I think that was kind of interesting. So the weapon was expanded and the armor improved throughout the war, and uh, this would be pretty much what Delta Force had on Kashyyyk in 19 BBY. So what happened to Delta's squad after the Clone Wars? Well, it's kind of unclear. They were definitely inducted, at least the remaining three members, into the Empire. Shortly after the foundation of the Empire, the RC was changed to IC from Imperial, from Republic to Imperial. And the uh, remaining commandos were either folded in to the 501st as part of an elite group, uh, Imperial Special Forces, Imperial Commandos. This was actually supervised by Vader himself. Funny how he was happy to choke a officer, but he seemed to have a... If he had a soft spot for anything, it was troopers. Then again, he told them to do something, they did it. So, Vader likes that. <clears throat> now, Sav, of course... Never made it back from Kashyyyk. He wasn't confirmed dead. He was MIA. It was planned to have him in a follow-up game, but it never happened. And it's said that after living on his own in the jungles, he was uh, eventually kind of befriended by some Wookiees and then ended up in the hands and joining the Rebellion. And it's even been speculated that perhaps he helped train the Rebel Commandos, the ones we see in uh, Return of the Jedi. After all, Old Man Rex is there, so... There could be an old man Sev in the background, or maybe he died later. But it's kind of interesting that he, he was the most aggressive one. But also he was the more Mandalorian one. And maybe after something like the Night of a Thousand Tears, he had nothing he wanted to do with the Empire. Boss and... Uh, sorry, found a piece of plastic on the table. You know. Sorry, Boss and Fixer, we really don't know. It's possible they kept on with the uh, with the Empire. The name Delta Squadron would be retired. Instead, it was given a numerical designation. Some other commandos, like Omega Squadron, would actually defect from the Empire, going to Mandalore. So it's possible that they did too. We know that they were in for a little while, though. But even though the Empire gave them a fourth member after Sev went away... None of them ever warmed up to him, or he never was part of the group. Again, these are these guys were born together. They they were brothers. You can't inject a, another brother when people are in their twenty, you know, twenty five, thirty years old. Scorch though, he appears in the Bad Batch, and he is there, one of the fifty or so commandos helping train the TK troopers, the ones that'll become stormtroopers. This is also where Crosshair ended up. And so he's opposed to the Bad Batch. Of course, that doesn't mean he's bad. It just means that he's on the side of the Empire. But then again, these are all kind of programmed for it. So we do he see him there. Whether he stayed forever or not, we don't know. Then again, Bad Batch has just started Season 2. Plenty of time. So we don't really know. We have a few ideas where a few of these guys might have ended up. But there's room for storytelling there. And it's nice that at least they are in canon I do like these special helmets. Now, some might criticize the Black Series Hasbro for these, but these are not part of the standard line. No one's forcing you to buy them. In fact, they are markedly part of the Gaming Greats line, which is always a uh, reuse, repaint, recycle series. But... I think they did a good job. I mean, I think a lot of people would have preferred if they used the body of Wrecker. But the gaming greats are already 
a little more expensive because they're a limited production niche exclusive item that always raises costs. I think if they had used the bigger mold of Wrecker, it would have gone from a $25, $30 figure to a $35, $40 figure. And since you need four of them to make the team, otherwise kind of what's the point? Yeah, they did fine. It seems like they gave it their all where it mattered. Again, I really like that they give us all three configurations of the DC-17M. I like that we get a total of three different backpacks. I like that we do get a unique sculpt for the helmet, even a special variant for Fixer here. Each of them has a, just a couple of new things that sets them apart. And, of course, we have different colors, red and blue and yellow. And I actually don't know what color boss is, you can tell me. But, I don't know, they bring me joy, and of course they came out over quite a long time, so picking one up every six months, well, you can spread it out, however it goes. And, hey, no one's forcing to buy. I understand why people don't like things. What I don't understand is why they continue to bitch about it over and over and over. And no, I'm not thinking of anyone in particular, I'm not even necessarily thinking about figures. Just in general, I guess I'm thinking about the channels on here that have complained about Star Wars for literally five years now. If you don't like it, I understand. Move on with life. Anyway, that's a topic for another day. Maybe a black box video. But I do. I just don't. I don't know. Habitual complaining bugs me. Instead, I'd rather just enjoy things that I enjoy. And, yeah, these are fun. It's hard to say no to any... Republic Commando. And now the squad's complete. Maybe we'll get Sergeant Va next. That would be... That'd be something. I'd go for Mandalorian too. Pretty much buy all those I find. At any rate, hope you enjoyed it. You know me by now. I can't do a short video. But I at least hope to do a thorough video. So let me know if you thought this was comprehensive enough. If not, next time I can talk about their underwear and their socks. Just let me know. This is Misha, and we'll catch you very soon next time. And now we come to Sev, the other junior member. Although he kind of has the older, younger brother vibe compared to Scorch. And he is, um, well, a bit of a psychopath. <laughs> Some say that uh, maybe he was drugged in his maturation tube or whatever they call it on Camino. Interestingly, of all of the Delta Squad members, he might be the one that actually is most... <laughs>